So we uh, connected before the session. We decided this is going to be lots of fun. We're going to do a quick intro of where we're at and what we bring to the conversation and then open it up. Uh, happy as well since there's only a few people in the room that we can actually expand that out. So if you've got questions and answers you're going through, um, got a contribution that you'd like to make, let's just do that. So for me, in my traditional role, I'm formerly the mayor of my city and community is my thing. Uh, connecting communities, working with communities and understand how to engage and nurture. And I think in the ISO space and the crypto space, that's something that some projects are missing. So I'm really interested in where the conversation is going to go. What we see about our internal tribes that we're building to give support and uh, validity to the projects that we're working on. But uh, Alexander had a really interesting comment as well to bring in in terms of the external communities who don't understand where we're at and how we try to engage into this sort of like closed out space that people are scared of and afraid of. So uh, I'm Janie Finlay, I'm with the Game Tester Project. Uh, a former mayor of my city and a keen person to uh, develop and grow the community around what we're working on. She was a mayor? That's super cool. Um, hello, my name is Lisa. I am director of partnerships of Stellar.org. Stellar is a blockchain protocol that facilitates extremely fast and an extremely low cost multi-asset transactions. Um, in my day-to-day -day life, a lot of times that looks like facilitating things like cross-border payments between financial institutions around the world. However, um, with the emergence of this amazing new field of ICOs, we've seen increasing adoption um, of Stellar as a platform for issuance of ICO tokens. Um, and maybe later I can talk about why we see a lot of firms increasingly um, opting to use Stellar as opposed to doing an ERC-20 token. Um, there's a lot of really interesting and compelling advantages there. Um, but we're also very much at the forefront of seeing emergence of ecosystems and communities around this ICO space, which I'm, I'm hoping we can talk about more of. So, thanks. Uh, thank you, ladies. Uh, my name is Alexander Dio. I am from uh, ICO Max. ICO Max is a securities compliant tokens uh, marketplace. I'm glad to uh, be here and share with you our thoughts in terms of uh, how and what and where we build our communities and our perspective about it. Thank you. So maybe to start, exploring this idea about what is community, what are we actually trying to bring into and how do we like, lay that really strong foundation to the work that we're doing? How have you found in your project uh, being able to people being able to bring people on and engage and develop, I suppose, that trusted network of people that can grow to be ambassadors in what you're doing. Have you found that? Uh, well, I come from a background of uh, investor, financial world, and knowing anything and everything about IPO space. And as I started to look into the alternative investment options, I found uh, the blockchain industry fascinating. However, at the same time, realizing it's truly wild, wild west. Uh, there is no specific guidelines. Everyone come up with whatever they, whatever we now, I guess, <laughs> uh, want to come up with. I never heard of a white paper. Then I hear gray paper, green paper, and then black paper, and then no paper. So which basically what that means, uh, it scares the community outside of a blockchain world. As such, everything starts with more of a curiosity. And I've spoke to a lot of people here. They had no clue what the blockchain is. They have no idea what the cryptocurrency is, how to use it, what to do. And they came to this conference just to find out. Uh, just do their first level of a due diligence, get familiar with this side of the world. And they're curious. Uh, then they go to the next step of, uh, okay, well, I'm curious enough. Let me dive in a little further. But then they look at the market of a cryptocurrency for the past 59 days. It's just red, pure red. Then they have fear. And as fear start to prevail, they block themselves away from like, okay, well, first of all, I don't know what it is. Second of all, I was curious enough to find out, but now I'm really, really, really scared. So, and I feel we just need to do a better job of uh, doing things right. And communities outside of a blockchain uh, will pick up uh, as they look into us 
as a solution or breakthrough technology, we cannot afford to not be straight, especially when it comes to am I utility token, am I securities token, and you guys, or I guess not you guys, but whoever, attempt to find any possible way not to be treated as security. I don't know why. That's just my perspective. Who do you think in the research you've done in building up the communities around your projects, who's been the best examples of bringing community into and understanding what's happening in the crypto world? You know, who's been best out there at breaking down that fear and engaging? If we were looking for examples of how to get support around our projects and really build that solid foundation, who do you think is actually, you know, topping out on that? Sure. So um, I have an answer to that that I will get to in a second. So yeah, you know, I think that there is so much potential for us to um, improve as a community how we're developing this new industry. Um, and you know, 2017 was like a bullet train, just like going as fast as possible when it comes to issuance of ICOs. And I'm personally just so ready to get past the, the statements of, I've raised this much and this is who my advisors are as like a way of evaluating the quality of a project. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from um, both, you know, platforms uh, like Stellar or like Ethereum developing broader ecosystems um, around themselves to support ICOs, both in terms of standardization, um, legal frameworks, uh, also ease of use and developing these types of technologies. But I think that there's also, um, there should be more, these tokens themselves or these projects themselves should be doing more to build communities around their projects and really educate um, their potential users or investors as to what they're doing, keeping open dialogues, um, you know, providing materials, showing accomplishments across different milestones. So, you know, I think um, an example of somebody who's done this in the seller ecosystem in a, a good way is Mobius. Um, so Mobius was uh, a pretty large ICO. Um, they completed their presale uh, a couple months ago, uh, maybe a month ago. Um, and, you know, it was a long journey for them to, to you know, get this project started. But throughout the process, they've been very proactive and educating potential investors and their token about where they are as a company, how they're developing, um, the progress that they've been making, um, and really creating platforms where they can communicate directly with those potential investors. <clears throat> um, so I don't know I, you know, I think that that's probably an example of someone who I think has done a good job as opposed to just um, you know, trying to get someone uh, fancy or reputable to like be an advisor and like just kind of get a bunch of fast money and then use that as like the way that they prove to the community that they're they're doing something well. So we're in the gaming industry, which is really advantageous because the gaming, you know, it's a massive tribe and so the intake is really high. We're growing at the moment in the game tester platform between five and 10,000 testers a day into our platform. So you say where they're having great exchange and communication, bringing in and advising people where they're at, what they're working on. What are you seeing that are the best platforms for managing communication en masse at scale, where we can all manage keeping people informed and up to date and uh, aware of what's going on? What are you seeing as the best way of doing that at the moment, the best cases of actually engaging in a community with communicating with community? In terms, of bringing, in terms of bringing people on board in our projects and actually keeping them on board so that they stay uh, engaged and supportive and become those ambassadors for what we're doing. I think that's the point of community, yeah. I mean, I think for us, what I've seen is pretty basic. I think, you know, use of Reddit, use of Slack, use of Medium, use of these different um, kind of forums to, to both, uh, you know, maybe have longer form writing where you're providing very high depth quality updates about your project and what you're doing, but also platforms that allow for two-way communication and engagement, um, you know, doing AMAs, uh, making yourself available to answer the tough questions. Um, I think that there should be a little bit more um, exposure in that way. 
Um, well, I look at this from a different perspective. So uh, rather than me giving or attempting to provide solutions or sources or uh, where and how, I, I think uh, they're all available out there. So, and Lisa, thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, uh, to me, uh, the best way to reach out to communities is, again, I'm coming back to this, is just do a right job. So uh, once you do a right job and you portray that to communities through different sources, the uh, community will pick it up. So uh, uh, whether it's uh, Reddit, whether it's uh, Facebook or any other vehicles to uh, convey your message and deliver what you try to accomplish, what's the opportunity there, what kind of problems you're solving, and how it's going to change maybe uh, first the region, maybe then the country, maybe then the world. Uh, I think the good news will travel much faster uh, than just attempting to do massive uh, marketing, if you will. And because um, to be honest, I'm, a, I'm really sick of the idea of uh, ICOs, bring a bunch of advisors, many pictures on your website, and just raise as much money as possible. My question is why, you know? Uh, and that becomes a trend, uh, and I'm so happy that this trend is ending, <laughs> so that we can bring the substance to this industry and really uh, come back to our normal senses. <laughs> and uh, attempt to do something right. Uh, and I know, so I'm repeating myself, but uh, that's my message. <laughs> You're good. Um, yeah, I, if I hear one more YouTube ad <laughs> about ICO. Um, no, but so one thing that's actually really exciting to me, and it, it goes back to this community. So from my perspective, one of the things that's always been exciting about ICOs is it democratizes fundraising. Right, both for the investor and the institution that's looking to raise. Um, and you know, a lot of the work that we do in Stellar is in emerging markets where the ability to raise seed funding um, or anything kind of between uh, like early stage level funding can be really difficult. Um, and so I actually just last week was in the Philippines where from the kind of money service side of our business, we have a lot of partners. Um, and I had uh, a couple conversations with local companies there that were very interested in doing ICOs. Um, and, and that was really exciting to me because they see that Stellar as a platform already has a lot of traction um, in the Philippines, that there's cash gateways into the Stellar network that are, that are already there, that there's a, a knowledge about the, the platform and how it works. Um, and these these institutions are looking to solve problems that are meaningful for people in the Philippines. Um, and that becomes really exciting to me because suddenly you're creating this platform where you're enabling more kind of liquid investment markets for people who are looking to solve problems in their own community and can engage on that front. Um, and that's what I'd love to see more of. I would like to see it be less of kind of like headline, how much money can you raise globally? And like, how can you as a company talk to people where you are, help to solve problems in your communities, whether it's industry-based or geography-based, and then allow them to evaluate that project and your solution and invest in your project so that they also benefit from it. Um, I think that's super interesting and exciting. What you raised there is uh, going into regions and the partnerships and the networks and the other element of this conversation was not only around community but our network. So as, a, as a, an ecosystem in blockchain and crypto, how we actually work together and how we uh, both share and learn from each other and people are providing specific solutions. So in our circumstance with Game Tester, we're a very unique but very focused part of the whole gaming ecosystem. So there's people that we're network with and engaging with and, um, and in this time, you know, being open to sharing and partnering up. How have you found being able to partner with others in the space uh, and bring on collaborators and, you know, share in this space, which is fairly new? How are you working with your partners and bringing that on board and, and growing through that? I think it's very important to uh, understand the key word of network, right? And as I was sharing what we do and how we do what we attempt to accomplish, a lot of people 
told me, oh, what about this company? What about that company? They do this. It seems like you're that, or maybe that. So different shades of uh, color. And I say, yes, but uh, at the end of the day, what you try to accomplish is perhaps different. So, And I always like to be in a position, rather than uh, attempt to be exclusive, I always say, look, if you have a great idea that would be complementary to our program or to our platform, why not just join the resources and sources and attempt to make this particular subject matter big enough or valid enough and useful enough rather than uh, attempting to hear the idea, perhaps steal parts of it, attempt to uh, replicate that, and then we become competitors. So to me, I believe if we uh, combine forces and uh, join the efforts, the job can be done so much faster. So that's how I see it. Absolutely. We are a group small enough around community networks that we can have a great conversation here. Is there anybody that's got any questions or contribution that you'd like to make? Are you able to project or do you want a microphone? You're really, you're good at all of this. So you're so multi-talented. No wonder you got elected mayor. Um, <laughs> so uh, my question would be around um, deciding on the community th itself. So Stellar is an example, for example, of something that you really do have a lot of applications. Um, some of the companies that we talk to have a lot of applications, some don't. But one of the things I've seen is people are building these communities of, let's say, investors but those aren't the communities that they're actually going to serve. So can you guys comment on how do you decide that? How do you figure out like what your I don't want to say, niche is and you know how do you kind of target towards that? In particular if you have something that's more generic, but even if you don't cuz on the one hand you want people to invest in you and they might not be the same people who will use your platform later. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's a really it's a really good question. It's something that we ourselves also, you know, Stellar has uh, people who love to trade lumens and you know hold lumens and are champions of it. And then that's not necessarily the person who I'm trying to persuade to adopt our network on a daily basis. So you know, where wherever you're at in the stack, it's it's a real thing. Um, you know, I think um, I think you need to I get. My recommendation would always be to start with who the end user is going to be. Um, and if you are able to understand their needs, um, you know, if, if you're building a, like a, a gaming platform, for example, um, and you're, you're launching a token on top of that, investors should be able to evaluate um, your uh, depth of knowledge and understanding about that industry, as well as the, the way that you're engaging with that community, right? So for me, it starts with really um, building out uh, that dialogue with the end user that you want to serve, making sure that you've kind of done your research in terms of understanding how this, you know, this new project you're going to build is actually going to add value into that ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, take that as a, a proof of point that you can then take to the investor community, right? I mean, I would love to see that. That would be a great way to differentiate um, different types of projects apart from we have this advisor or that advisor, right? Um, so I guess that's my thoughts there. And I think also, if I'm clear on what your question was, in any ecosystem, there are many communities. So you have to be tasked to focus on the different needs of and the people that can actually engage and bring on those. So there are your internal tribe, those people that are gonna be your advocates, your ambassadors, and actually grow with you. They wanna be part of what you're doing, the end user. But there's definitely the, you know, there is the investor engagement. You have to have someone specific, then do that language and bring them on. There's going to be a whole range of your partners. You know, we are a specific part of the gaming industry and we will be partnering with many people that are doing what they do best, which is what you were saying and the previous panel was saying. You know, don't try and solve everything. Just do what you do with extraordinary excellence. So you're going to have to have a range of people in your own community that are reaching out and working and nurturing all those other partnerships and relationships. Has anyone else got a question or a contribution or something that they'd like to add to the? Mike 
So if you're, if you're looking at uh, the ICO world, you have utility and security. How do the communities differ in how they want to be treated based on those two different types of ICOs? If it's utility, these people are just buying these tokens and using them for something, to play games or buy points or whatever. If it's a security, which is the trend that seems to be happening in the ICO world, are they going to want audited financials, monthly reports? Are they, I mean, it's pretty, two pretty different um, communities that you're talking about. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. And I'll add uh, to that. Uh, there is another hybrid version of ICO. It's a pre-IPO slash ICO. What that is, nobody knows yet. And quite honestly, yes, there are different communities that supports uh, the ICO that is purely security and the ICO that is uh, utility. And uh, ICO Max uh, job is to, A, first of all, screen. So whether you are utility or you are security, once you're utility, we have nothing to do with you. So we outsource it to someone else. However, once we are talking about the security, then what do we do? We have to do appropriate valuation of your token price. Because 95% of all those tokens that are circulating in the marketplace, there's no basis on how the price of a token was determined. It was driven by the bonus, private sale, pre-sale, post-sales, ICO sale, God knows how many sales you do just to raise a lot of money. However, the determination of the price was never determined based on basic principles at least. So our job is to do that first, to evaluate the token. Why is it $1 or 10 cents or 1 cents? Do you have to have 1 billion tokens circulating out there? Absolutely not. So what are you doing? You're just polluting the market. And when the market basically doesn't support it, what do you do? You burn all your tokens just to support the price of this token. And what I've seen in the past, and it's happening even now, once the institutional investors or big investors are loading their tokens on exchange, it's a free fall. So the founders of the uh, company, rather than focusing on the development of the product, now all of a sudden they are focusing on holding on the value of this token. Because that's not their job, but they have to. It's already free fall, and unfortunately, there's no way or mechanism to hold it back. So they are burning tokens like start with high, and then you end up very, very, very low. And I don't understand the logic behind it. Why do you do that? So it's more of an economical arbitrage of things of that nature to tend to do. I think that's a perfect segue actually into where we're at, because if you've got a very strong um, user case and user base and you develop a community and you've got engaged networks, then there's a strong foundation for that to actually be uh, very successful. Without those things, which is what we're talking today, then the dropping out um, disappears is exactly what's going to happen. So for the projects to understand how to develop, how to engage and how to sustain and nurture their communities around their projects is what's actually going to make sure that there's a, a long-term lifetime in what's actually being launched. Yeah, and I just... Um I want to say, you know, you're exactly right. When we think about utility tokens, I think it tends to be higher engagement with those end users and that developer community, typically, um, who see kind of a use case. And so they have this ability to evaluate the, the quality of that project. Um, I think it is so important for companies like Alexander's to be um, providing insight and guidance in the security space, right? I mean. Raising money is raising money, right? It's not, we, we have a new mechanism that we're doing that, but there's still kind of age old ways in which we evaluate what a, what a project should be valued at. Um, and so, you know, I think for that security space, um, building robust communities around those projects who can help provide third party evaluations um, and give the investors um, more comfort and insight um, because they're not, an individual company. They're sitting across all these companies, right? And so their ability to um, assess based on multiple, you know, use cases versus, you know, I'm an individual and this is what I think, um, I think is extremely, extremely valuable. Yeah, and just to add on the second point of uh, whether you have to share your financials 
whether you have to do a lot of things related to uh, letting communities know what you're doing from inside? Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the only thing that perhaps uh, needed to be done, rather than making it in a manual way, but build a protocol inside of the blockchain so it's done in an automated way. So at least that's what we attempt to do, is to uh, create, uh, or it, we are doing this in such a matter to uh, engage the ICO companies to uh, write into their protocols all of their financials, write all of the disclosures, write everything that is needed so public knows. Because otherwise, it, it's becoming a, a black box where nobody knows what's going on from inside, a lot of people only looking from the outside. And the perception is, oh, you raise a lot of money, how are you using this money? There's no a mechanism to track the spending of these funds. I'm not saying it's happening in the IPO world, absolutely not, but I believe if we want to change the world and bring value to this community, I think that's what we should do first. Be very transparent. And it's all about the blockchain. Why do we even start the blockchain? Because you can have a ledger of all of the things that you do. Write it in, yep. exactly all of your steps, how much money you spend, for what, not on parties, but actually developing the system, developing the technology, and making an impact in the community. So that's how I, how I see. Cool. Uh, I guess we're thinking about wrapping up soon, unless anyone else has a burning question. Um, so I was given permission to just give a really quick uh, bit of information about Stellar to anyone who's considering doing an ICO. Um, I kind of mentioned in the beginning that uh, we have a very compelling platform that I, that I hope certainly anybody who's thinking about um, launching an ICO token uh, will do some due diligence and consider Stellar for. Um, in short, there's a couple advantages. Um, so first is that uh, the gas cost on the Stellar network is much, much lower than anything on Ethereum. Um, where you're looking at somewhere between 25 and 30 cents per transaction on the Ethereum network. You can do about 100,000 transactions on Stellar for one cent. Um, we were designed to be very low cost infrastructure for multi-asset transactions. Um, in addition, we have very high speed. We don't use proof of work. Um, we have a uh, Stellar consensus protocol uh, developed by a Stanford professor, um, but it essentially enables us to have an open public network that can achieve um, consensus every three to five seconds. Um, so your ability to, uh, to have consensus on your transactions is very fast. Um, and then another very, very big component that folks should consider is that Stellar has a built-in distributed exchange, which means that if you're issuing a token, you immediately have the ability to have that tradable um, in an open marketplace. Um, and as we continue to see increasing growth in the ICO marketplace and token issuance marketplace, um, I think that it's gonna be harder and harder for these centralized exchanges to continue to list these tokens. Um, so, so having a place where you can immediately trade upon issuance is really compelling. Um, and we still have lots of simple, we call them simple contract features. You can do a lot of really interesting things. So we're not Turing complete um, like Ethereum, but I would uh, guess to say that about 80% of these token projects um, really don't need super complex contracts in order to be successful. Um, so if anybody wants to talk about it, I'm here, but just wanted to throw those details in. Fantastic. So uh, in wrapping up and from, you know, I've been really proud to be a part of this from the Game Tester platform with what we're doing with GT Coin. Um, we're we're going to go run a mic over here. Um, but in closing up, part of developing community at a great rate is about providing that flat platform for the project that you're running. And you've got a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just have a question, uh, just, just, just a really, really uh, quick one. So um, I wanted to ask if, um, what do you think is the best way to, uh, you know, to engage dialogue with the local communities? As you know, we have like there is like a very dif differences regarding the lo the, lo the local places and the communities. What do you think is like the best way to get into and to create an, a very engaging dialogue 
with the local one. So I know in our, in our case, we're uh, touching testers in almost every country on the globe. We're growing by a rate of five to 10,000 a day at the moment, which is just incredible. So for us to be able to reach in, and that was one of my questions before, like who's doing this as best case? Because that's a challenge for us, right? We need to be able to create and sustain those meaningful relationships in a positive way where they trust what we're doing and they feel like they're part of it. So what we're actually being able to do is reach out to the people that are the early adopters in those areas and create great conversations, be very vulnerable and open and very personal about our relationship with them and then create ambassadors in each region so where the community can actually have that conversation and grow and then work as a part of that. Because if you want it to grow organically and naturally and actually be strong and have a foundation in those areas, you need to actually you know, have people on the ground as part of that community, um, leading that community. And that's what we're trying to create. Um, I'm not saying that we do it to the best of the ability and what's the best practice out there, but that's definitely our strategy towards that. Uh, I agree with uh, what Jenny uh, had mentioned. And to be honest with you, that's not my job of doing it. So we have uh, marketers who uh, do a great job of doing it, putting analytics together, really looking into uh, which channel we need to target. And they provide resources and uh, reports. I, I'm not the best person to answer on that question. You know what's really interesting? Part of my role um, coming on as communications director is actually really about community development. And the guys saw the opportunity on behalf, you know, on top of their tech and on top of their platform and top of the things that they do really well, that they're really engaging with people in a very specific tech, almost, you know, they, they're incredible at what they do, but a very cold and analytical sort of transactional way. And for us to actually grow and maintain and sustain that relationship, we actually had to go down a community development model. So it wasn't necessarily just about marketing, but it was about engaging. It was about understanding and being part of. Um, so we're trying to be a sort of a best place, a best placed first engagement in terms of community development around this sort of crypto environment in that way. Does anyone else have any questions or anything? Yeah, you've been you've been burning to ask a question. I can tell. Thank you uh, so much for the talk today. I just want to ask a question about the initial traction that ICO raises. So, like, how do you even like? Uh, because I see something new. I know you, you guys talk about a vision, appeal to the why, why this coin or whatever, right? So the thing is that, uh, so how, how do you gain the initial traction to reach out to people who don't even know about ICO or coins or whatever you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think, in, in my opinion, there, there is some need to um, engage with people who have some awareness of what's going on, right? So you're going to be fighting a pretty big uphill battle if you're trying to get um, engagement um, through communities of users or investors that like, don't even know what blockchain is. Um, so I think also looking for uh, pockets, whether they're kind of industry or geography-based, where there is that um, awareness is, is really useful. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of really um, exciting and interesting like wallet providers who are enabling adoption of cryptocurrency in a lot of really interesting parts of the world. Um, and so, you know, working with them may be an interesting gateway to, to kind of say, if you already have people who are like playing around with holding Bitcoin, maybe you can kind of work to increase that, that knowledge front a little bit more um, and make them interested in, in holding some type of ICO token or platform. Um, I think partnerships are a big thing. So looking for people who already have an ecosystem or community around them and then you know, saying, you know, we think that our project is gonna be valu valuable for your community because of X reason. Like, do you see an ability to engage, at least on the educational front, right? Like, you don't have to market and sell this, but we want to work in helping to, to educate um, your users or members on, on what we're doing and why we think it's important. Um, I don't know. I think if you understand what your use case is and you understand specifically who you're trying to target and you zero in on that and then work back from there, then there has to be a community that you're engaging with. If there, if there isn't clarity around that, then it's going to be really hard to get that traction. But understanding what the use case is and then going directly to those users and understanding where your networks are, who's actually in the space and influential in the space uh, and coming on board, that's, you know, that's the place to start. But it's a multi-layered um, approach to that. Yeah, if you believe in your 
product and the problems you're attempting to, uh, to solve. Uh, we in particular engage uh, conferences, all kinds of conferences related to tech communities and attempting to go from within rather than from uh, out and explaining uh, what uh, we are all about, <coughs> pardon me, uh, what the ICO and communities uh, in that space, at least in the tech world, already started to accept this, understand this. Then we reach out to uh, even sports communities uh, through these conferences, um, having an opportunity to uh, share what we do and how we do. They may not know everything and anything, but at least we create curiosity. I think on the panel prior, I'm not sure who was in attendance on the previous panel, but they were saying actually um, you can go in cold into those sorts of markets and then try and, you know, get the exposure from the outside in or going out. But they were saying, you know, engage people with specific expertise with certain things. So if you're not sure where to start with that traction, there are people in the space that have been doing that and can actually advise you and support you through that. And I think it's really important that we do collaborate, that we do do what we do well and engage people that can help us through that and navigate the path. Um, and then the more success we have, then as an ecosystem, the better reputation that we have, uh, and then that actually helps with that process as well. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for being engaged and having part of the conversation, and it's been really fun.